to talk about this one. We are, we, we are going back to Acts series because we left off where uh, it was in the middle of the, uh, middle of the, the book, right? And uh, now today we will go back and we will finish off with uh, Powell's missionary journey. Like he has four missionary journeys uh, in his life. So we will talk about those missionary journeys. And then mind you, like when you read his missionary journeys, like there are like so many things that we can actually not just learn, but then we can practice those things. And as we practice as church, it's, it's so powerful. It is beautiful. It is, uh, you know, it will revive us as church as we learn about the missionary journey of Paul. But then today, before we talk about the missionary journey of Paul, there is this one chapter of, like, uh, of, this, of this powerful incident that happens in the life of Peter, okay, through the life of Peter. So that is in Acts chapter 12. So I, wanna, I want us to focus, I want us to spend some time now learning something about this chapter, this story um, in Peter's life, and and, and also reflecting and then asking God to what needs to be done in our lives, even as we learn about from this chapter. Now, if you have Bible with you, mobile, you can open. Or if you want the, the, the hard copy, we have hard copies as well. Do you want how many? Do you, do, you need, do you need any Bible? Okay. All right. So translators, can you please maybe like help them? Uh, mumble near near to them and then just help them. Today we don't have Amrita Didi. She was she had a COVID and then the, but she is recovering right now, so she's resting. So we're gonna pray for her as well. So we are in Acts chapter twelve, verses one to ten. Acts chapter twelve, verses one to ten. May I just pray right now? So before I I just go into this. Um. Father, I want to pray that you will help me to speak clearly and uh, with your authority, God, Father. And just, Lord, and people, those who are listening, God, right now, would you help them to understand your word and beyond what has been spoken, God, what, has, what will be preached, that you will help them to understand what you want, us to, want them to understand today, God, Father. God, would you reveal your words to us? And uh, just, just, Lord, I want to speak, Lord, your your protection over each one of us right now, that our minds will be set to, to hear your words, God, and uh, may it bring healing and deliverance in our hearts, in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm reading Acts, Acts chapter 12, one to four verse, verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> that passage first. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of, of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial after the Passover. Now, what you see here in Acts is, is that the early church, they began to preach the gospel. And as a result of the gospel, as a result of the gospel, they were preaching, there were amazing things happening. Miraculous things were happening and people were being free, being healed, and all of these things were happening at that time when they were preaching the gospel. And Peter was one of the, one of the disciples, was actually really passionate about preaching the gospel. And amazing things were being done through his life and through, through his ministry and through witnessing the gospel. Now, what you see here, uh, as the early church, they began to spread the gospel. As the gospel was, it was being expanded, spread, as being spread, preached. Same time, you can see the suffering was also being like, what you can, they, they, they also had to suffer through as they were preaching the gospel, as they were witnessing the gospel. All right, the suffering was also growing within inside the church and outside, especially outside, of, outside the church and also inside the church as well. You will see in Acts, they had to face a lot of conflicts inside the church as well and outside, from outside people as well. Now, what you see here is, is that the suffering in our Christian journey is something that is eminent, that is inherent. It, it happens, right? It's a part of our journey. It's part of the Christian life. Suffering or trials, uh, any kinds of battles that you face 
uh, when you stand for the cause of the gospel or when you want to stand for the truth of Jesus Christ in your life. When you say, I love Jesus. And for that, you have to pay the price. You have to pay the, you know, you have to carry the cross. There is a cost for that. All right? So in the sense that today we just say suffering for everything, but then I think I want to say that it is easier for us to understand when you actually then say, I belong to Christ, and there is a price that you have to pay for that. Right? Then you have to pay. And in some countries, like, you really have to suffer because of Christ, because you have, because you have now declared that you are a Christian. And even amongst ourselves, we know that some of our stories that parents have left that person because she has now declared herself as Christians in our family, right? To that degree, like people have suffered, even in our church, you get to know those stories if you ask some people in our church. Um, so I was actually, when I saw, when I, when, I, when I was reading this Acts, the book of Acts, yes, of course, like the, um, the disciples, they were going through this suffering, and then they had to face this. And then, but then they were, when, when, they, when they faced with sufferings, any kinds of trials, you know, one thing that came out to me, and I was reading at the end of the chapter, every, every you know, one incident happens, there is a suffering, there is a conflict, and a lot of the things happen. And then, but the end of the chapter, it ends with like, but then they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's how it ends. All right? If you recognize that, if you read, and every time it, has, it, it says that they, they were filled with joy and then uh, and, and filled with the Holy Spirit. What you see here is just that one of the things that stands out to you is just that, of course, the suffering is part of our Christian journey, it's a Christian life. But then, this question of like, how do you, how you respond to that suffering is very important for us. How you respond to that suffering will allow actually you to know what kind of follower or what kind of Christians you are or are you, all right? What kind of person are you and in, in, in what ways you're loving God when you, when you, how you respond to God actually now, not, not proves. I mean, like, it, it, the, the word proves is, like, kind of strong, but then proves really, you know, uh, what kind of disciples you are and how you are following Christ when you suffer through something in your life, when you go through trials in your life. Now, when you ask these questions and when we read this story, what do you see? How has church responded to, to the Peter's suffering or to their suffering? in general. And then the second question is, is that how Peter has also actually then responded to his suffering, all right, in the prison, or how, what he has been experiencing uh, during this suffering right now. So when we have these two questions, then it is, it will help us to, to look at what is happening, and then how, how has the church uh, been, uh, how has the church responded uh, to, uh, to the Peter's suffering? Now, what do you see in verse um, verse after verse five, like after verse four, five to six, there is this 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 first line. It talks about in verse five. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was honestly praying to God for him. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was honestly praying to God for him. So how the church was responding to their suffering or to Peter's suffering? What they were doing? They were honestly praying for Peter when he was in the, in the prison. They were praying honestly for, for Peter while he was in the prison. Now this honestly verb, you know, it has, I think, intentionally put there, it is, you know, to, to emphasize how they were praying for Peter. Uh, the, the word in, in, in Greek, it's like actinos. Can we have that on the screen, please? Acti, actinos, honestly. It means in their full potential. In their full potential, all, or, or stretching of the muscle. They were praying to the degree that, to the point that they were stretching 
their muscles. In their full potential, they were praying. The whole church was praying for Peter. If you remember, like when Jesus was praying at the, at the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke twenty two forty four, the same verb has been used when he was praying for the disciples for the whole world before his crucifixion. And, and the kind of like his sweat turns into blood, right? So the same verb has been used to explain how he was praying for the whole world, for you and I, before he was crucified. Now the church was praying in their full potential for Peter, in the sense that I feel like the church was also hurting when Peter was hurting. It is like they were imprisoned with the Peter. They were suffering with the Peter. They were one with the sufferer at that moment. I think this really, this prayer, this line, verse 5, precedes the miracle that happens next. What happens next in verse 6, the prayer comes before the miracle that happens in verse 6, right? And that's what we see. How has the church responded in their suffering is by praying to God with this prayer. Now, it's very key. It's very important for us to know. During the suffering in hard times, the trial times, what we do and how we respond to God. Many times we feel like, wow, God has abandoned me. Nothing is happening. Nothing is turning out, right? We feel it is very natural to feel anxious and scared, frustrated, deluded. And we begin to, I mean, like to the extreme, like grumble and really accuse people. And, then, and all of that can, those, those, those things can, can come out and we, we react to the, to, the, to the situations. But then now one thing that we can learn is from this chapter, from these stories, is that how has the church responded during their suffering is by going to God uh, with this kind of prayer. Um, and then the second question, how has the, the, what actually, not Peter has, yeah, how, how Peter has responded to, to his suffering? What do you see in verse 6? In verse 6, this scene amazes me like, like Peter is in the prison and it is, it is the ancient prison. It's not like, like, you know, it's not like in Hong Kong, like, what do you call it, the, the Hong Kong prison, like where you have TV and uh, you know, you have dim sum in the morning or maybe masala chai tea, you know, if it is in India, right? So you can ask anything you want to. Like, it's not that luxury kind of prison, like, right? it is the prison that where your hands and your, your hands and your feet are bound, chained. And uh, you can see like later Angel saying to the Peter, like, now just, just, just uh, take your clothes, like, you know, no, clothe yourself. And then it, it seems like, you know, many times when these prisoners, like when the people were, were, were put into the prison, before they were taken to the prison, they were flogged. They were flogged. They were, they were beaten up so harshly, right? They, they were beaten up. And then they were, they were made naked, naked. And then they were, they were like an animal led to the, to the, uh, to the slaughterhouse. And they were dumped into the prison cell. Right? And you can imagine the similar scenario, similar picture uh, in Peter's case, that, that he's in this kind of prison, bound by these chains. All right? And then the Herod makes, makes sure that this Herod, the grandson of the Herod the Green, who beheaded the John the Baptist, right? this cruel king, makes sure that he will not get out of this. And then he puts double, he doubles up the, 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 the soldier guards to guard him so that, so that he will not escape from this, from this prison. Making sure that his fate, just like John, his, uh, what, James, uh, John's brother, James, right? That, that he was going to be killed. Now, knowing that if you will be dying tomorrow, what will happen if you know that you will be dying tomorrow? What will, ha what will happen if tonight is your last night? What will you do? What will you do? What will be your reaction? What will you, be, will, you, will, you, will you be thinking in your mind? I mean, like, can you sleep? Can you sleep? Right? But here, this verse says that Peter was sleeping between the guards. Peter was sleeping between the guards. And it is amazing that, that how could Peter sleep knowing that he was going to be killed? Right? What might have gave him that that mind, that, that, that peaceful mind that he could go through his tough times having rest or sleep. And
and not worry about what happens next. I do really believe that it was the joy of the Lord that was helping him to take a rest first in God and to take rest for his body as well. It was the joy of the Lord, I believe, that God's presence was with him. And he knew for sure that perhaps maybe God would actually rescue him. God would maybe deliver him. And even if not, then he knows that, that his life is in God's hand. He, he, he does not have to worry about his life. I mean, like, uh, what, a, what a scene that he could really sleep through. I know for sure that, that many of us, we struggle to, to have rest, you know, that, that kind of rest. But then I, the, the, the source of rest, the joy, actually, the joy of the Lord becomes that source of rest for many of us. And I think that joy was there for Peter. And then Peter could really sleep through the night, his toughest times. Now, um, actually, there was, this, there was this, this, this report that Alice Yu, Alice Wu, who had reported in, in Hong Kong, uh, South China Morning Post, that during this time, talking about the COVID time, homeless numbers surged, our mental health crisis ballooned. These are only some of the long COVID issues the new administration must resolve to fix, right? And I think I echo with her, it is true. Because during the COVID time, what happened? You know, we are coming kind of like a, away from the COVID time, right? Now we're post COVID time. But then we still have those effects of this after the protest pandemic, right? What happened during protest and pandemic? One of the things that we wrestled through was that many of the families, family members, they died in past away away from the homeland, right? And then the, we could not actually have the blessings of a mourning with them or being with them when they were passing away, like this separation, right? And then due, due to the restrictions, like we could not be there when we wanted to be there at the most. So that was one thing. But then what happened like during the time in itself, like many children, because of the Zoom and all of that, they, they just like, they were glued to the screen and uh, kind of like they, they, they were disoriented from the life. And uh, it was very true that after the COVID, like we, we want to go out and do some activities, but then the children were like not really wanting to do anything. They kind of became lethargic and, and even tired in their, in their minds and in their bodies and, and became, now began to gain weight and, and all of that. So, so, you know, it had a, a very like a dramatic effect on them and their growth and all of that. Now, what we saw during the COVID time for church, what churches here in Hong Kong was is that 50% of the congregation they left during the, uh, for, for, for many reasons, for good reasons or for many reasons, they left during the COVID time. So most of the churches became like the 50% less congregation, all right? And then, and then uh, what we were hearing was just that many of the leaders or pastors or, 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 or you know, like the, uh, the, 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 the leaders that were leading the church, uh, they became, they began to experience this, what do you call that, the compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue. They began to, now, as they were like addressing the issues, as they were counseling people from one after another, now they begin, begin to dry it up, like they became tired of, 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 of going through all of these things. And, 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 uh, and <clears throat> whether we know or not, but then many of the missionaries, uh, missionaries or leaders, pastors, they left Hong Kong during this time. And uh, we were actually doing prayers last time, a uh, prayer gathering of pastors. Many of the pastors, they, we, we saw like they were not there anymore. And not because, like, I'm saying, like, they, they deserted this place because of that. But then the same thing happened. Their parents were getting sick. Pa parents were getting ill and all of that. So they had to leave and they had to exit out for, for all of these reasons. So some of these things happened. But then, you know, during this time, what you saw was just that God was, God was also actually moving, bringing this suffering to, to more people, to make them more like, uh, kind of like to refine his church, to refine you and I, Right? And then we have seen that too during this time. But then we also, like, we, f we have experienced the traumas of these, these events in our, in, our, in our city, in our country, right? As if, like, you can see that, that many of the people, they were imprisoned under the, under the power of this, of this thing in their lives. And uh, for to cope or to, to overcome these problems, you know, when we go out and ask people, how are, we, how are you doing? And then many people could say, like, okay, I, I'm okay. But then people are not really doing okay in their hearts, right? How are you sleeping? 
they are not sleeping well. And then many times we just put on the fake smile like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But then it's just that I'm, no, I'm okay saying was not enough for them to really go through or to cope these traumas in their lives. And we have seen that. We have experienced that. I don't want to like to bring back those memories, but then I actually wanting to, to say this because then many times we find ourselves when we have these traumas back in our minds and the current situations, current problems that you're facing in your lives, these might have become a, a prison, a prison cell, that way we find ourselves. And not knowingly, we do not know what we are battling. No, not knowingly, we are trying to cope each and every day with just because like we have to live, we, we have to go through these problems in our lives. You know, one of the good news that I want to share today, the message is just that, that you don't have to be there in that place. That as the way the light shone in the prison shell of Peter, God's light can break through the darkness that we have around us. And that is the powerful message that I wanted to share with you today. That, that God has, God, God, in, in, in God's presence, it is, it is this power that actually that breaks, breaks his light into our lives, that lights our path, that we don't have to be there in the dark shell anymore. Just a question. I do not want to generalize every problem is like a, like a dark shell. You might have the problem. You might be having issues. Or you might be facing some circumstance in your life. That may not be serious. You just think like, oh, that's, that should be there. But then I'm just like thinking about like, you know, if you are in that place of like struggling with something and that has become a bondage for your life, you know? Now going forward into this new year, how you want to live out how you want to live with God. Here is the message that you don't have to struggle with that kind of particular things in your life. God has now, God is bringing light into your lives so that you can break free out of that prison cell and experience his freedom in your lives. The, the first message that I really want to share is just that this God's light breaks into, into your dark shell, all right? God's light has power God, God's light has power to break things, uh, these, break, these bondages that, that we are chained, that the bondages that we are struggling in our lives. It has power to break through our problems that we are facing in our lives. And you're struggling alone in your lives. The second, God's, God's light has power to, to actually direct us onto the right path, onto the right path in our lives. All right? It has power to break through the darkness that is that is around us. The second is, is that God's light has power to direct us onto the right path that we need to walk on. In Psalm 30, 30 I think it's 39, it's 30, 36, 36, 9, it says that, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. All right? It is the light of God that way we find our, our life. It's a fountain of life. It's just ever flowing overflowing joy that we can find in the, in the presence of God's light. It's really that. It's, it's powerful that when we come into the, presence, into, the, into, the, into the presence of God's light, that's where we find the joy. And that joy sustains us through our suffering, through our challenges that we are facing in our lives. And we must and we need to come to that light. We need to seek that light that God has for us. In Psalm 119, 105, it says that, you know, your, 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 your light, we know that verse, right? Your, 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 your light is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God, God's light, actually, when, it got, when we are in God's light, when we, when we are with God in his presence, actually, it helps us to go forward in our lives, all right? And, you know, many times, the certain strategy is that he brings these doubts and he, he, he makes us confused, especially during the time of, turmoil during the time of hardships in our lives. And he makes us question about God's authority, like whether he's present in your lives or not, whether he's listening to your prayers, whether others are listening to you or not. And it makes you feel like this, this, this confused person. But then, you know, what we need to know is just that when we are in the presence of God's light, then God's light alone directs us onto the right path, that he helps us come again, where he helps us, where we need to be where we need to be going. The second one is just that the message out of this story is just, <clears throat> is just that God, um, when we go through suffering in our lives, 
that God actually not just like, you know, he directs us, but that he actually, he, he, he invites us to, to pray in the same kind of prayer for people those who are suffering around us. Praying the actinos prayer. Actinos prayer. Honestly praying for those who are suffering. As if you're making their suffering your own suffering. And praying for them. And suffering with them. Suffering with them in their prayers. Knowing that God is going to bring victory in their lives through your prayer. All right? And I think that's the, that's, the, that's the role of the church that God wants us to play in this year. To see through your prayer, God bring victory in our lives and in their lives. How many times we become critical of like when people go through things and, and, and it's like, you know, for us as ministers, we try and we try, try, try hard. And, and it's very obvious sometimes we become frustrated. At, you know, we have the tipping, tipping point of like, okay, I can't do this anymore. You know, so we just like slack back and, and, and kind of like we don't do it. We don't push hard, right? But then, you know, and then for many people, they just give up. Many people, they just give up. Or many people, they just say, okay, you know, because of that now, see, this, is, this has happened to you, you know? So all these like alternatives we might like take um, to when we face some kind of problems or when we see someone facing the problems in their lives. But then as a church community, what God has asked us to do is just that, to pray on behalf of someone, to stand for that person and to pray and to suffer with that person. And I think God is calling us through many sufferings there are many things that we are facing in our lives to do that, to do that. And do you want to be that church? Do you want to be that person praying for that person? Honestly praying for that, doing actonous prayer on behalf of that person. The third one is just really that this beautiful scene, at the end you will see that, um, um, I'm going to read those, those passages. <clears throat> Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the shell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up quick. Get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And, uh, and toward the end, you will see verse 8 through 10. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him, Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that, that what the angel was doing was really happening. Right? And then on 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to, to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel, the angel left him. What you see is, is that this last thing, that the angel come, coming and uh, nudging or